大家好，这里是听广播学英语频道。独立宣言还有别的版本吗？这个节目讲述了一个在一七七六年七月四日之前的另一个独立宣言，凸显了美国历史上一个鲜为人知但重要的事件。好了，我们来了解这一段历史吧。July fourth, seventeen seventy six, Independence Day. It's arguably the most important date in American history, when citizens of the colonies declared total independence from Great Britain for the very first time. But what if it wasn't the first? Wait a second. This this is actually real. This is a real slice of American history that incredibly people don't know about. You're listening to the broadside, where we tell stories from our home at the crossroads of the South. This week, my colleague Jared Walker takes us down the rabbit hole of North Carolina's Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence and entertains a shocking possibility: either someone's lying, or we may need to change everything we know about American independence. Just jaw-dropping, hands in the air, kind of going. How do I not know about this? Dave is a former writer for Sports Illustrated and ESPN the magazine. He's currently a correspondent for Meadowlark Media, and while he's mostly covered sports in his career, Dave's also written a few books. His latest is about a little-known historical document called the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence, or the MacDeck for short. And I delight in when I give talks or readings. I can see Mechdeck face from a mile away. I can see the people who are, you know what? And then you, what happens is people start. They pull out their phone, and they've got now it's Mechdeck face denial. I know exactly what he's talking about because I've experienced it myself. And Dave had his own version of Mechdeck face about a decade ago. I can remember it clear as day. I guess with all obsessions, they, <laughs> you never forget、um, how you started down the rabbit hole. We had my wife and I had moved to North Carolina, almost sight unseen, and just immediately fell in love with with Charlotte, with North Carolina, with everything about it. And like a lot of transplants, they started to wonder about the culture and history of their new home. Just as I'd begun to think that. Our youngest daughter, Kate. I was picking her up at Davidson Elementary School, and was waiting for her while she was coming in from the playground, and just happened to be staring at the North Carolina flag, and wondered why the date on our state flag was 14 months before we had even declared independence as a country. There's two dates on there, and neither one of them is July Fourth. Yes, and so this immediately picked my interest. Where it's like, what a weird thing to have these obscure dates on your state flag, and、um, yeah, here we are, ten years later. <laughs> so Dave went home and Googled the first date prominently displayed on the flag, May twentieth, seventeen seventy-five, and he was introduced to the Mech Deck for the very first time. He found out that it was written on that day by the citizens of Mecklenburg County, which is modern-day Charlotte. The document declared that the people of that region were now independent from their British rulers. The language bore a suspicious resemblance to portions of the later Declaration of Independence, and Dave also learned that because of that, the Mechdeck's authenticity had long been in doubt. Armed with this knowledge, he immediately realized one of two bizarre things could be true: either Charlotte is actually the cradle of American independence, and that Thomas Jefferson may have plagiarized the document that these men created, or North Carolina has been celebrating a lie by displaying the date of the Mech Deck on its flag, state seal, and a few million license plates. Not long after this revelation, Dave began turning his trip down the rabbit hole into a book titled "Who's Your Founding Father." I started the whole thing as a skeptic, and I was planning on yeah, just kind of doing more of a tongue-in-cheek 
I, and again, I think a lot of people follow this similar path. For me, it was all silly and funny and, oh, this is some kind of ghost story. And then I saw the letters between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And then that's just fully mind-blowing. The letters he's referring to are well documented. In 1819, a newspaper in Raleigh printed a purported copy of the Mech Deck. This was the first time that knowledge of the document became widespread throughout America. It was a bombshell that called into question the originality of the Declaration of Independence. And the news eventually reached the two surviving giants of the revolution, who were, for lack of a better word, frenemies. For John Adams, who I think had always been sort of jealous and a little bit bitter over the attention that Thomas Jefferson and the credit that Thomas Jefferson had kind of taken for himself as the author of the Declaration of Independence, the, the first thing that jumps off the page is it's a gotcha letter. It's John Adams just going, I knew you were a phony and now I have receipts. Huge levels of pettiness. Oh my God, it's, it's, you know, people think the discourse is bad now. You should read some of these letters. Incredible amounts of shade. And, you know, I, accusing someone in writing of plagiarizing in that time, I mean, that's an automatic pistol duel to the death. So he, it's not something to be taken lightly. Now, the odds of two 80-year-old men shooting each other in a duel were pretty low, even in the 1820s. But the fact remains that Adams initially considered the authenticity of the mech deck a real possibility. Even if Jefferson called it, and this is a quote, spurious. As Dave continued his research, he uncovered a mountain of supporting evidence in favor of the mech deck. There were signed affidavits from eyewitnesses, a report commissioned by the state legislature of North Carolina that was published in 1831, and the account of a man named Captain James Jack, who very likely delivered secret documents from Mecklenburg County to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. Captain Jack is known as the South's Paul Revere, only he's much braver and he actually rode 550 more miles and he didn't get caught and he basically wasn't a product of PR. <laughs> so Captain Jack, it really should be Paul Revere is the Captain Jack of the North. And then there's the later presidential visits. Yeah, it's again, it's another twist where your jaw just hits the ground when you realize that Literally up until, you know, decades ago, this was a, a holiday in Charlotte that five or six sitting presidents had come to Charlotte to celebrate and honor the Mech Deck with 100,000 people at most of these events. And presidents like Wilson, Ford, Eisenhower, Taft, you know, coming into town to celebrate America's first original patriots. So after finding out about all of this, Dave had an epiphany. You could maybe even call it a conversion. Wait a second, this, this is actually real. This is a real slice of American history that incredibly people don't know about. And I gotta be honest, at this point, my blood is running red, white, and Carolina blue. I'm completely sold. You're sold, right? We might need to rewrite the history books, maybe move Independence Day up a few weeks to May 20th instead. There's only one problem. If I wanted to see the original Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence, where would I go? Well, it, de it depends really on, on what you believe, but the original document burned in 1800. Oh, yeah, that's a problem. Belief is a powerful thing, but history, history is mostly what you can prove. Fire is the great enemy of archives. Jim M. Buskey is a historian at George Mason University who specializes in the American Revolution. 
He says at face value, there's nothing fishy about the fire that supposedly destroyed the mech deck. With the historical record, stuff like this happens all the time. Who knows what we would know if we didn't have fire. But without a surviving primary document or a dated copy that was printed in something like a newspaper. Yeah, it's hard to confirm. Um, I, I, there is indications that something happened on May 20th, although we don't know what. And a lot of the evidence we have is hindsight evidence of people writing later or people telling stories or people relaying evidence that was told to them by their ancestors years later after they're dead. So it's hard for us to say for sure whether or not this happened. I mean, for me personally, I think if it did happen, the more interesting thing is how out of touch they are with the rest of British America at this point. And if if this does happen, they are so far outside the mainstream that they're basically off the map. At that point, most colonial leaders hoped for reconciliation with Great Britain. But if there were a people that could be a full year ahead of everyone else, it would have been the notoriously rebellious Scots-Irish who settled in Mecklenburg County in the 1700s. These are, and I cannot emphasize this enough, radical Protestant Presbyterians. Everybody in the 18th century who was not a Scots-Irish Presbyterian knows who they are because they don't like them. Charles Wood Mason, who is an Anglican cleric who is traveling through this region in the 1760s, comments frequently on what he sees as a very ghastly, mean, rough people. So yeah, a way too early declaration of independence coming from these folks, it's certainly feasible. But Jim is skeptical, and he says there are a couple of other possibilities. A common theory is that the citizens of Mecklenburg County simply misremembered very real events. And while that may sound a little condescending, there were a lot of proclamations coming out of communities throughout the colonies around this time. The War of Independence, as it becomes to be known, breaks out on April 19, 1775 in Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. And as news of that travels south, you start to see these resolves, you start to see these pronouncements being issued condemning what the British have done, condemning what Parliament had done in particular. And the faulty memory theory gains steam when you realize that the same committee that supposedly produced the Mech Deck also created a very different proclamation just 11 days later. It's called the Mecklenburg Resolves. We know for sure that it existed because surviving copies were printed in newspapers at the time. And curiously enough, it's not nearly as radical as its controversial cousin. In fact, it's kind of boring. They are saying that civil authority is collapsing uh, until there is a resolution to this crisis. It is incumbent upon us to organize ourselves into a kind of caretaker government to ensure order and stability. So you can see in these resolves, it kind of sounds like independence, but there's not an actual use of the word independence. In this scenario... Decades later, the collective memory of the Mecklenburg Resolves could have transformed into the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence. And then, of course, there's another option, a hoax, which is extreme and an idea that Jim is frankly hesitant to endorse. But it leads to a bigger question. Why would anyone want to fabricate or even exaggerate something like this in the early 1800s? You know, you start to see a lot of founding myths kind of almost immediately, but really in the 19th century when the founding generation starts to die off, and really after Washington dies in 1799, it's not until after then that you get the cherry tree story and the Washington chucking the silver dollar across the Potomac and all that kind of stuff. But as these revolutionaries are dying off, as people who served in the army are dying off and people who served in Congress dying off, what you see is a kind of mad scramble to claim a connection with the revolution. And some folks were better at it than others. You know, it's it's Boston and Virginia that tends to get all the credit right, but places like North Carolina are putting up their hand and saying, hey, what about us? So what about us? If the mech deck is in doubt, what is North Carolina's big contribution? 
For that, we have to go back to where this story started. <laughs> what a weird thing to have these obscure dates on your state flag. One of those dates represents the mech deck, but the other is a reference to something called the Halifax Resolves. This was a resolution adopted by the North Carolina Provincial Congress on April 12, 1776. The proclamation made North Carolina the first of the colonial governments to call for total independence from Great Britain. And it's undeniably real. There are two known copies. One is in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and the other is located here in North Carolina. So rest easy. The state is still technically first in freedom, but with an asterisk. And that's not unusual. Jim M. Buskey says the founding of the United States is much more complicated than the version you were taught as a kid. It's constantly evolving and often obscured by myth, legend, and even our own inability to confront the harshest of truths. It's not clean, right? It's not clean at all. It's so messy. It's taken 250 years to get all of this right. We're still arguing about it. We're still pulling our hair out. We're still going to archives in the United States and Canada and Great Britain and France trying to find smoking guns for all of this, hoping upon hope that we have, at long last, by the time we die, some kind of clear answer. And we're not going to get one. <laughs> uh, history. <laughs> 